Good afternoon, and welcome to this afternoon's Wheelhouse Talk with Jim Keen, President and CEO of Steelcase. The Houndstein Center and GVSU's Design Thinking Academy are excited to bring this collaborative program to campus. My name is Nikhil Watsa, and it is my pleasure to welcome you. This is my senior year at Grand Valley, soon to be graduating with a Bachelor of Science in Physics. I'm grateful through my time here to have had the opportunity to be involved in Student Senate, Phi Gamma Delta, TEDx GVSU, and the Laker Traditions team. As a member of both the Cook Leadership Academy and Design Thinking Academy, I am especially eager to hear insights from those who will be on stage in just a few minutes. Speaking from my experiences at previous Wheelhouse Talks, each of you is in for a wonderful, wonderful evening ahead. So thank you for sharing this time with us. As you might already know, the Houndstein Center's Wheelhouse Talks highlight the philosophies and experiences of leaders from a variety of disciplines, communities, and cultures. These individuals take center stage as they share with us their experiences and perspectives. Their lessons help us to chart our own paths forward and provide a blueprint towards reaching our own goals. The Wheelhouse Talks are a space for reflection and innovative learning. They are a call to arms for anyone seeking positive change, and they are, they are a celebration of human endeavors and the potential within us all. GVSU's Design Thinking Academy has played a vital part in making this program possible. The Innovative Academy was established to prepare students as innovative thinkers and problem solvers who will contribute to finding solutions to civic, social, and business challenges of the future. Today, Jim Keen and his colleagues will be addressing topics related to leadership and design thinking. But before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about who he is. After 17 years in multiple leadership roles at Steelcase, Jim was appointed president and CEO of Steelcase in March 2014. Since then, he has led the 105-year-old Grand Rapids-based company, which is now a $3 billion global leader in the office furniture industry. As a clear example of a local company with a global reach, more than half of Steelcase's 11,500 employees are now based outside of West Michigan. In his role, Jim has shepherded Steelcase's evolution from a manufacturer to a partner that creates furniture, architecture, technology, and experiences for the diverse world of today and tomorrow. Jim serves on the boards of the Economic Clubs at, at Grand Rapids and IDEO, one of the world's top practitioners of design thinking, and is director to Grand Valley University Foundation. He earned a Bachelor of Accountancy from the University of Illinois and a Master of Management from Northwestern University. Today, we are proud to welcome Jim Keen and his colleagues, Hannah Aiken, Chief of Staff at Steelcase, and Adam we Weiler, Director at WimCat, um, to GVSU. We look forward to learning from them about design thinking, its process, and its implementation at Steelcase. We hope to discover facets through which design thinking connects to the vision and ethos of leadership at Steelcase and abroad. Please welcome me in joining Jim Keen. So good afternoon. It's uh, our pleasure to be here to talk about uh, design thinking. You know, the Wheelhouse uh, program is about leadership, and leadership comes in many different forms. There's people leadership, there's process leadership, there's business leadership. And today we're going to talk about thought leadership, how we can lead the thinking process of others, and specifically through uh, a methodology that uh, is being talked about a lot these days in the world called design thinking. So before I even start, I'd like to get a sense of how many people here, how many people in this room would feel like design thinking is an old friend, something that you've been doing now for quite some time, you've led some design thinking exercises, you've been on design thinking teams. So just a show of hands, these are kind of the practitioners that could be on this panel, thank you. Uh, glad to have you guys here, and hope we have some things to share with you that'll advance your knowledge and practice of design thinking. How many people here are on the other end of the spectrum who maybe are hearing about it for the first time, you've maybe read about it or something, but uh, you're really at the very beginning of, of understanding what design thinking is. Good, okay, so it's about half the room probably in that state. And the rest of you are somewhere in between, and that's great. So uh, we think we'll have something for all of you here today, uh, something for all of you to take away as you uh, think about how you might use this tool, either in your business or, or your educational uh, journey or in your everyday lives. So uh, a little bit about what design thinking is. So simply put, design thinking is a methodology for solving problems. And there's lots of ways of solving problems. Most of the ways we use on a day-to-day -day basis uh, have their roots in analytical thinking, where we see a problem, we analyze the problem, uh, we can kind of take the problem and break it up into pieces through analysis, 
We can develop a hypothesis about how to solve it. And then we begin to make the problem a little bit better. How can we incrementally improve that situation? To be honest, 90% of the problems that we face in the world can be solved like that. And most of us are trained to solve problems in only that way because it's such a useful methodology. So analytical-based thinking is based often on math. It's often based on, on history. So the things that we know have worked in the past ought to work in the future. Uh, as a result, it's very reliable. So reliability means that you do something and you get the same result as you got last time. And most problems work that way. So you might say, I want to study best practices of other organizations to see how they've solved this problem. I'll, if I do what they do, then maybe it'll solve my problem too. And again, most of the time that works. So nothing against reliability-based problem solving, nothing against analytical-based problem solving. But unfortunately, we all have problems in our lives and our businesses that don't seem to go away that quickly. You know, we've tried it several times. We thought we had the problem solved. It just keeps coming back over and over and over. In our parlance, we call this a wicked problem, a problem that for whatever reason just won't go away. There's something about these problems. There's something about the forces that surround those problems that are so intense, so continuous, that every attempt, it seems, to solve the problem by making the symptom a little less severe or making the cause a little less uh, poignant, anything we do seems to not work very well, and back it comes again. Can, can you guys, I, I want everybody in this room right now, just to make this uh, your own personal journey today, to think about a problem you have right now in your life, or your work, or your educational journey, that you would say is a wicked problem. So a good way of thinking about this is, what's the thing when you sit down with your, your partner or your friend tomorrow morning over coffee you're likely to be talking about again? It just won't go away. It might be a family issue. It might be something to do with that vacation property you don't know what to do with. It might be something to do with that car of yours. It just doesn't seem to get any better. Okay, is every Seriously, you've got to think of a problem, otherwise you won't get as much value out of this. So how many people have a good problem in their mind? I'm not going to call you out here, so it's okay. It's a safe place, safe place for learning. That's what design thinking is potentially for. It's how do you break through those problems that just won't go away? Design thinking started at places like IDEO. So designers, people who are working on product development, found that efforts again and again to solve a particular user problem just didn't result in products that were as successful as people thought they would be. Maybe you can find a way to make the toothpaste holder a little cheaper, but can you really find a way to make the toothpaste holder better, to respond more completely to the needs of the user? So product designers were among the first to use design thinking principles to solve wicked problems, like the, the drip at the end of the toothpaste in the morning. And What's been interesting is as, as companies like IDEO began to teach the world about design thinking, we found that we can use it for a whole range of other problems, business strategy problems, uh, problems that might in, exist in, in uh, the not-for-profit not sector, in, in, uh, in problems that just don't seem to go away in everyday society, society issues that we face. And we'll talk about some of that today here with my colleagues. So what is design thinking? How do you go about this process? There's a few key attributes of it. So the first is design thinking almost never starts with the problem and tries to find a way to make it better. That's incremental. Instead, design thinking starts with the problem and tries to imagine a future state that's fundamentally different. So incremental thinking or incremental problem solving is making things better. Design thinking is trying to imagine a state that might be fundamentally different. So again, a show of hands, how many people here have something like an Amazon Echo in your lives? Okay, you know those devices that sit on the kitchen counter and can answer questions about the, the weather and so on? So think about that. The team that developed the Amazon Echo wasn't really trying to make anything in your house or in your kitchen a little better. Like it's not a little better than the microwave. It's not a little better than the television. You could say it's a little better than the computer, but man, that would be a stretch to say that that little device somehow replaces your computer. It's really a fundamentally different kind of device. It's, it's maybe like your phone if you have a phone that's got Siri on it or something, but even then, that's a phone. And this is more of a kitchen appliance that's sort of shown up in our lives now. So there's an example of you never would have gotten to the Amazon Echo if you started with the microwave or the television or the telephone you really have to step back and say, what's, what's the fundamental issue about people trying to get information in real time 
in their living rooms or their kitchens? And how can we solve that problem in a different way? Does that make sense to you? So there's an example of using design thinking to imagine a future state and create something that nobody really knew they even needed. But now that we have it, we wonder how we got along without it, for those of you who use it. Another key uh, attribute of design thinking is the design methods, the use of design methods to solve problems. So in addition to thinking about the future state, they go through a rigorous process. It's actually uh, more than just post-it notes up on a whiteboard. It's a rigorous process that is best described as a diverge phase and a converge phase done iteratively. So diverge means uh, you try to broaden the number of solutions you're imagining for this problem. Many of us in traditional problem solving ha already have the possible answers down to just two or three when we start trying to solve the problem. So, so the reason that it's wicked is usually the problem is beyond the most obvious answers. In the diverge phase, you're trying to bring together a diverse group of people to think about the problem and then imagine ideas without really any critique. The more ideas, the better, in fact. One of the hardest things in the diverge phase is to keep people from editing each other, critiquing each other, rather than just stimulating each other with a wide range of possible solutions. So this is where you see the post-it note rooms and things like that associated with design thinking. It's not really about the post-it notes. It's about the mindset of just freeing yourself from being judged and throw out that crazy idea. Who knows? Yeah, your idea might have been crazy, but it might stimulate somebody else in the room to throw out an idea that isn't crazy, and they never would have thought of that idea if they hadn't heard your idea. So the diverge phase is about populating the room with as many ideas as possible. And then the converge phase is when we're synthesizing down. What are the common themes and patterns in all of those ideas that we can begin to align around? And as you get comfortable with those, you then go through another phase of diverge and converge. And again and again, very different than traditional problem solving, when we want to believe that if we just analyze the problem, we can solve it. Here, you're, you're never really sure you've solved it. You continue to diverge and converge until you begin to hit something that is that sort of aha moment. So imagining the future state, practicing this process of diverging and converging. Another key part of this, and it's something that the, some of the original uh, uh, authors of design thinking talked about a lot, was the need to be user-centered. So if you want to develop that new uh, toothpaste tube, it's not enough to sit around in the conference room and debate with your colleagues what, what a toothpaste tube ought to be. You have to go out and watch people use toothpaste tubes. You actually have to stand in their bathrooms with them as they brush their teeth, as uncomfortable as that can be sometimes. Uh, some people who develop tax software would actually follow the users home, ask permission to come home with them and watch them as they installed the tax software to see what, what was easy about it and what was difficult about it. Where were they getting confused? So this idea of almost an obsession with the user, that you have to put yourself, immerse yourself in the world of the user in a complete way. And only then, only then when you're really immersed in that problem, will you have the right instincts when it comes time to separate the good ideas from the bad ideas. That's called empathy. Can I feel what my users are feeling? Can I feel the root of this problem? And it takes hard work. That's when you leave the conference room and you have to go out there into the wild and do it. That's why often design thinking includes people with backgrounds in anthropology rather than accounting like me. So anthropologists are used to going out into the world and trying to study the artifacts of different civilizations to try to piece together what must it have felt like to be part of this culture. And that's anthropology techniques are applied now to problem solving at this deeper level, whether it's product development or something else. Finally, prototyping. And I don't even want to leave prototyping for the end because that, in a sense, is missing the whole point. In typical, traditional product development, typical problem solving, we use all of our analytical methods so we don't waste money and time testing bad ideas, right? That's the whole point. We don't want to test bad ideas. In fact, we'd like to believe that if we did our work in the typical, traditional process, that we don't even have to test it because we're that sure it's worked for so many other companies before, it should work this time too, that we could just launch it. Okay, maybe we'll test it and then we'll launch it, but we're pretty sure it's gonna work. Design thinking is the exact opposite of that. We prototype early in the problem solving process and the act of prototyping is actually meant to drive learning. So you prototype to fail, you watch that failure, 
You test that prototype with actual users. You watch them use your new toothpaste tube or whatever it is. And by watching them, you go, oh, it's interesting how it failed completely to achieve this thing I thought it might do. You go back to the drawing board. You do another prototype as fast as you possibly can. You go back to the user. You test it again. So it's this rapid cycle. They call it learning cycles in the world of design thinking. Rapid cycles of iteration, converge, I'm sorry, diverge, converge, prototype, test with a user, back you go again, diverge, converge, prototype, back to a user. So does it feel different? It is a really different process for product development people even in Steelcase. It took us a long time to get people to abandon the old methods of doing product development or solving really any problem and moving to this new method. But once you get that rhythm, you can't imagine really solving these problems in any other way. Now it becomes kind of a natural way whether we're trying to attack why a certain business isn't making money, or how do we penetrate a market we've been trying to penetrate forever, how do we launch a new product that we've never launched before, how do we treat our distribution and train our distribution to do something they've never done before. Instead of sitting in conference rooms and imagining that, we go out, we immerse ourselves in the situation, we try to feel what it feels like to be that person, and from that insight, that empathy, we reach better decisions. We're not always perfect, but we also have developed a really healthy appreciation for prototyping and failure and, and the learning that comes from that. All right, so that's uh, design thinking in a nutshell. I'm doing okay, John, so far? He ought to be teaching this class, so he's kind of like my judge up here. So, um, and I've left a lot of stuff out uh, that I'll be glad to talk to you over cocktails. <laughs> so the next part is the, um, the how do you use this? So you can use it, as I said, in product development, but you can also use it in a lot of business cases, and you can also use it in the not-for-profit sector. And the colleagues I have joining me today are actually going to talk about that. So I'm going to introduce them uh, one at a time. And I've asked each of them to prepare uh, some remarks so they can add to my remarks. And then uh, we'll go into some questions here on the stage. And then I'll also invite you guys to ask questions. So think about what you might want to know about as uh, they uh, begin their remarks. So first of all, Hannah Aiken. So Hannah is my chief of staff at Steelcase. And I drafted her to come here and talk today. Uh, before being my chief of staff, she was in the corporate strategy function at Steelcase. And, uh, and really, in our corporate strategy role, we use design thinking in the way that I described. So corporate strategy thinks about market forces shaping the industry. Uh, we think about our strategic frameworks that we use. Uh, and she uses these tools around design thinking uh, to drive strategy at Steelcase, working with my team, the senior team in the company, uh, to push their thinking ahead. In fact, we were together today doing some of that. Uh, Hannah joined Corporate Strategy in 2016. Uh, she has a marketing uh, degree uh, with a background in marketing and degrees from Hillsdale College. Uh, before Steelcase, she worked at Kimberly Clark. Uh, and in her spare time, she likes playing water polo, and she's learning how to play the guitar, and she's got lots of other interesting uh, um, hobbies. So, Hannah, if you don't mind, uh, just taking a few minutes talking about how you use design thinking at Steelcase. So first of all, I'd like to start with a quick level setting for you. Um, for those of you who don't know how we define strategy. So if you think about strategy, it's really just making choices in the present in order to get to a desired future state. So if you think about this simple um, or sometimes less simple choice of choosing a college, you think about the kind of person that you want to be, maybe the job that you want to have in the future, and then the choices you make about that college decision are formed because you want to, to get to that future state. So it's the same thing with companies. Companies think about what they want to do or be in the future, and then the choices that they make day to day in order to get to that future state. So the tricky thing, or the, the complication, is that our world is changing a lot. Jim talked a lot about Amazon Echo, thinking about the phones that you carry, that's so different than how we behaved 10 years ago, even five years ago. And for those of you who remember before there were telephones, it's very different. So um, when we think about uh, strategy with a company, you say, well, how can a company, especially one over 100 years old, know how to plan for the future when so many things are changing? And that's where we think about design thinking at Steelcase. So I'm just going to take you through, through a, a quick recap of our journey of applying design thinking to strategy at Steelcase. And it makes it, uh, the way that I'm going to tell this story makes it sound a lot more linear. As Jim was saying, 
This is constantly changing, iterating. You're coming back, you're thinking. So it's definitely not a step-by-step -step clean process in the moment. But for us, we started with thinking about the future, imagining the future state, and saying, what are the forces, the things that we see happening right now in the world, whether it be economic issues, social issues, um, things that we're seeing in our industry, in other industries, something as simple as Netflix. What's the impact of that on the future of work? So we gathered through a very rigorous process all of these different forces together that we see now, and then we projected that forward, and we said, let's imagine together what the world might look like. What is that future landscape, and who do we want to be as a company in that future landscape? As Jim said, we think about the user. So who are the people who are working in that future landscape? And what will their needs be? What will the tensions be? When they come to work every day, what are the things that they're going to be thinking about, feeling, needing? And then together, once we had that alignment on what that future state was, then we entered into a process of saying, how can Steelcase then meet the user needs in that state? So I'm just going to illustrate quickly with one example. This was a whole series of work proto uh, prototypes, workshops, more work, prototypes, workshops. But there was a particular one that comes to mind when I think about this. So when you think about strategy being done at a company by the senior executives, the gyms of the world, a lot of times, at least before I came to Steelcase, I would have thought of that as being these very wise, seasoned, old people. <laughs> you got it part right. Room. You got it part, part right. right. <laughs> wise, wise. Um, in a room somewhere, maybe with some highly paid consultant, thinking for a long time and then coming down almost like the commandments written on stone saying, this is where we're going to go. Well, for us, I want you to imagine a highly intense workshop in May of this year. In one room, we had our executive team, and they were looking at that future imagined state of the world and saying, what are the clear, clarifying, what are the choices that Steelcase needs to make about who we are, what we do, who we serve, how we serve them, and, and really honing in on what are the different choices that we make. One of the things we talk about is it's not a valid choice, if not doing it is stupid. <laughs> so there has to be a valid decision where you could legitimately go either way, and it would probably be a good choice. So while they were clarifying that through an intense day, there was a whole other room of us in a, different, in a different room in the building doing a very intensive workshop with people from all over the world different functional leaders, um, people who work with customers, people who work in our operations. So people with a diverse viewpoint from Steelcase who are close to different parts of our market. And we were all working together to say, from the ground up, sensing the things that we see in the world, what are the possible ways that we could bring value to people in the future? And let's come up with ideas. So as Jim said, we're, we're generating ideas, then we would hone them down and say, okay, you've got to pick the best five. And then we would diverge those out again and then converge. And then the next day, we joined the two rooms together and we said, what are the things that we're seeing similarities here? And then how can we take those quickly, those ideas that we think have a lot of value, and test them in market with customers? So that's just one example of one workshop, but this was a long process, and it continues to be a process. So we're continuing, con continuing to iterate, refine, and keep on defining what the choices are and how we want to move forward. And that is how that we can adapt and change quickly towards that future vision, but recognizing that the world in the future is changing all the time, so we need to be quick to understand it, understand how it's changing, and then keep prototyping as we bring value to our customers. Thanks, Anna. And can I, I'm going to ask you one other question. I warned her that I might uh, mention that she's under 30, just uh, to make this point. But uh, so I've been at Steelcase for 20 years, and I when I joined I, when I joined the company, I became part of the management team. And I was in that room, but I'd already been working for you know 15 or 20 years at that point. 
to get in that room, you had to have a lot of experience. You had to have uh, risen up somewhere in some other organization or within the company. You had to have something to bring to the table that was based on typically experience, work experience. And what I think is interesting is, uh, is how you, uh, as somebody who's much earlier in the career than I was, play that role now in the management team. You, can you just talk for a second about how design thinking uh, becomes a tool to help you skip that step of needing 20 years of experience? Yeah. Um, so I think, it, yeah, he did have permission to mention my age, but not specifically. But <laughs> So I think it's an interesting question because I think it goes back to what you said earlier about thought leadership. Design thinking is interested in delivering an incredible value, whatever that might be, to people. And it really comes down to who has the best idea. And the way to create the best idea is to get diverse perspectives. So having multiple people in the room from different perspectives, you wouldn't want a whole room of people who look like me or think like me running a company, trust me. But by having different people in the room with different perspectives, you get a much better understanding of the whole. And it brings a, a different, um, even questions into the room. So I think sometimes one of the values that I bring is just to say, uh, excuse me, <laughs> what's the strategy for dummies here? Like for somebody who is young and, and hasn't had all of the experiences the other people in the room maybe, um, how would this come across to someone in my age demographic or my background when they're seeing this happen and it brings a different perspective into the room? So yeah. I think it's about collaboration and, and diversity of thought. That's right. So Adam, we're going to bring you into the conversation. So Adam Weiler, I've known Adam for a number of years. Um, he is the, uh, he's a community-driven designer, educated, educator, and social entrepreneur. He's director of social enterprise at WIMCAT. You guys know what WIMCAT is? Ooh. Western Michigan Center for Arts and Technology. And he's responsible for developing new business models. So think about that. This is a not-for-profit, and he's responsible for developing new business models. There's a clue in there about what he's going to talk about. That meet financial and social impact goals. And he, he's, he founded Ambrose, which is a community design and print lab, uh, back in 2008 and has been leveraging his diverse background in fine art, mathematics, design, education, and entrepreneurship versus like accounting. <laughs> anyway, um, and he's, he's a design thinking coach at Stanford's D School, which is like one of the places, best places in the world actually historically until Grand Valley is now making these investments in design thinking. Uh, and has consulted with businesses, schools, and not-for-profits. And I asked uh, Adam to join us today uh, to talk first about Ambrose, because I think it's one of the most remarkable models uh, in Grand Rapids, but really throughout the country, uh, in thinking about uh, a diff uh, using design thinking to solve some social issues. So can you start with that? Yeah. Um, I wanted to start with maybe this one. Uh, they say that, there it is, uh, that passion and pain can be really closely connected. Um, and to what you were saying about like with prototypes, like the goal isn't to go out and sell prototypes. The goal is to, like put a prototype into uh, the real world as soon as possible so you can get tangible feedback. Um, so being in Grand Valley, I grew up in Iowa pre-internet uh, and uh, studied fine art and mathematics and was like, I love problems. And college was this amazing four year stretch where that love of problems uh, didn't necessarily get to hit the real world um, it was nice in theory, but it wasn't always nice in practice. And so uh, out of school, I didn't have the best portfolio to be hired as an applied uh, like designer. And uh, all of a sudden felt the sting of my lament of the business department. Um, and so uh, was wondering like, man, I wish that I would have gotten a chance to taste these different professions. Growing up, I thought uh, the world was really black and white. You can be an accountant or you can be a starving artist. Uh, and I'd rather be a starving artist because that's, sorry. <laughs> um, and so it was in response to that, and it was also seeing, I was a, a youth director in Holland, uh, seeing students wrestle with like, what is it that I want to do when I grow up? And the question was like, well, uh, additionally, we had an after-school program that we had partnered with AmeriCorps um, that we were serving primarily uh, those underserved, underserved students after school, and we would ask them, like, well, what do you want to do after school? And the primary thing was, like, well, I want to get a job. And being a, a, 
coming from a place of privilege, it was like, why would you want to get a job after school? That's silly. But that, uh, that was the start of realizing that like, to be a designer and to be a human-centered designer is not just to design for yourself. Um, so that said, we started a series of after-school workshops and had this idea of is there, is there a way to sort of self-sustain uh, learning environments for high school students? Uh, and we started uh, screen printing uh, and visiting guest artist studios. Uh, let me pause for a second. The idea was to, was to somehow over the course of a year expose students to the creative side of business and the business side of creativity. A uh, big learning wasn't that, that there was that dichotomy, but there was this massive gradient of opportunity to inject creativity, whether you were an accountant. Now, granted, within reason, you don't want to get too creative in that field. Um, yeah, it's uh, caused problems before, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but there's opportunities to solve problems in each one of those areas. And so we worked with guest artists and actually developed a curriculum that paired students. We started off with fine art, we moved towards applied arts, photography, uh, graphic design, marketing, product design and development um, over the course of a year and had actually sold these shirts as we called it the Maker's Dozen. And so uh, we had subscribers from all over the states pay 20 bucks a month and that kept the after school program free for students. Um, all the while that this was happening, we were growing our sort of uh, uh, business to business side of screen printing and it got, had grown to the point where we actually need to hire folks. And so there were some of our students who had graduated high school that didn't still know what they, they wanted to do and so we started hiring them. Um, and then also running every Thursday these... these which gave those kids a first job. First which job, Which is one of yeah. the toughest things yep. to get. Um, and so it was... Uh, Hey, how do you estimate? How do you do an invoice? What does, uh, what does this chemical reaction do? How, how do you make a good print? Um, all of these things kept growing until eventually uh, we had doubled every year for about eight years and we're wondering like, man, we had, we were trying to figure out, this was in 2008 when we formed our legal structure, what, how we should exist in the world. Uh, B Corps were non-existent back then or like just on the, on the horizon. Uh, L3Cs didn't really exist back then and had, didn't know what to do because a portion of what we were doing was philanthropic in that every Thursday we would stop everything and open our shop to high school students to make all of our materials and supplies and we would rally friends to come and lead these workshops. Uh, at the same time, uh, yeah, so we ended up structuring it as an LLC and we had grown to the point where it's like, we need to figure out how we're gonna exist in the world. Um, it was at this point in time that we approached the West Michigan Center for Arts and Technology, AKA WIMCAT, uh, and they do an incredible job with after school programming here in Grand Rapids and getting students to graduate on time. Uh, as many of you I'm, I'm sure are aware, just because a student graduates on time and is admitted to school doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to school. And so out of that, we saw this opportunity, it was kind of like a hand in glove, where it's like, oh, we, we're doing this and we're employing students uh, and trying to do an after school program. You guys are an after school program and trying to figure out how to employ students. What might it look like for us to team up? Uh, so we teamed up three years ago and this was our first cohort of students and the idea was this, is that over the course of a year, uh, how do we give students, again, thinking about prototyping, so these are students aged uh, 17 to 22, how do we give them the best possible experience uh, with the real world in the hopes that they can uncover something about themselves, what they're good at, and at the same time something about the way the world works. Uh, and so the idea was to move through these cycles where you visit you know, production, marketing and sales, research, design and development, accounting and finance, and management and HR, uh, and that inside of each of those areas you would kind of gauge, hey, is this something that I could see myself doing? Uh, had been fortunate enough to work with Steelcase uh, to go through some lean manufacturing, uh, training with our students so that they, not only were they practicing and sort of gaining exposure to these things, but as they were employed in the shop, uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 hours a week, that they had the opportunity to apply those things. Um, so it's been super exciting. Now of this first crew, uh, Jen Derrick, who is in the back, is now on full time with a salary and is taking over more and more responsibility. So it's really exciting uh, for him. I, his girlfriend the other day was like, you're like a real man, you're a real man now, you got a full time job. Uh, 
And I think that this, uh, what's exciting about this opportunity and I th is that in the midst of all of this, uh, how do you go about having the sort of imagining alternative futures? And for many students in our area, they don't get the chance to imagine those because they don't know anybody in those situations. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what's been exciting about this is looking for corporate partners and having folks excited to say like, hey, we would love to help expose our, your students to what we have going on because the reality is like those opportunities don't always exist. Um, so out of the lessons learned there, uh, what we realize is there's this massive fear where it's like, I don't know what it is that I want to do. Uh, and because of that, I'm afraid to start. And so we've been working with, well, what might it look like to reimagine uh, a gap year for students who can't afford a gap year that blends uh, employment, exposure, reflection, all that kind of stuff. And so where we're at now, uh, we've had our two years go through this prototype of step year. Um, we've learned so much and have failed a whole lot, uh, but are continuing to sort of like empathize and say, figure out, man, how quick can we iterate on this thing to make an improvement? And the, the idea, is that this wouldn't be something that could just serve students here, but that it would be a business model that we might be able to replicate elsewhere. Yeah, in fact, that's a, that's a nice, um, when done right, design thinking also starts to embrace something else called systems thinking. So just as I said that sometimes these wicked problems are held in place by forces that just make it impossible to break the cycle. You might call that a vicious cycle, where each part of the system seems to make the next part of the system even worse. With design thinking and systems thinking, you try to think about virtuous cycles. So how does, the, how does the part, if we're successful, if the part we're working on works, how does it actually make the next part easier? So we've got these kids, right, at WimCat. They need jobs. We have a thing that needs jobs. They can create a business. That business generates profits. The profits puts more money back into WimCat. You start getting one of these virtuous cycles, and then you can scale it up, because it actually does scale. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so it was. Uh, over this past summer, it was two of our students were talking, and they were like, "Man, we should we should like start our own print shop." And the, there's part of me was like, "I taught you this thing, and now you want to go start yeah. another thing." Uh, that felt a little, I don't know. Uh, at the same time, there was so. Well, welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was so. That's not an imagination that I don't know that they would have had were it not for those experiences. Yeah. And so to be able to create something that does instill the confidence, like, oh, I, I could see myself doing that, um, is, a, is a treat, so. And you're, can you just add a little bit, so you're not even taking this idea, you too have scaled this up, so you're thinking about how design thinking and the things you've learned at Ambrose could also be applied now in the community to issues around poverty and justice that are also kind of these intractable wicked problems. So just maybe a minute or two on that. Yeah, we have, um, Equity is a conversation I think is on everybody's mind right now. Uh, have been have been lucky enough to help facilitate some of the collective work that's happening under uh, Invest Health, which is a spectrum initiative to eliminate racialized outcomes in the 49507. So that works with uh, healthy housing, affordable housing, uh, in, in, child and maternal health, um, food access and security, and workforce development. Um, and what's been exciting in the midst of using design thinking to facilitate these sessions where sometimes you have, might have 20 stakeholders in a room attempt, attempting to identify new opportunities that they could collaborate to sort of create something that might help break or like create a virtuous cycle where they can chip away at some of these systemic uh, racisms that exist in our community. Um, and additionally with, with K-Connect, uh, using that same process to eliminate racialized outcomes in K through 12 education. So what's been exciting is that there, that this doesn't just exist in a, a business space as a way to create more value, but that it's also being used in the, the nonprofit space to say like, how do we think more systemically about this and in what ways uh, has, have our balance sheet, sheets essentially been separated into social like social responsibility and, and corporate responsibility shareholders, a nice sort of like reunion of those two where it's like companies are saying like, how do we care more uh, about our community? At the same time, uh, nonprofits are thinking like, well, how do we also embrace the sort of uh, sustainability that we need to attain as well? Very good. So I'd like to invite anybody in the audience here who has any questions. 
uh, to come up. There's microphones on both sides. Just come up and we'll recognize you as you're standing there. Uh, and uh, any questions at all you might have about design thinking. Um, and I'm going to ask you guys to think in a minute here about uh, how you use it in your everyday lives and how people might uh, use the things you've, uh, for, for things that are a little less uh, dramatic than a company strategy or uh, solving poverty, et cetera. Yes? I don't know if this is serendipity or not, but I uh, recently finished an article entitled The Dark, or Dark Factory. Are you familiar with it? Uh, yeah, the, the idea of uh, artificial intelligence and automation could cause factories to go dark. Yep. Yeah, what we have, what, if, if you believe that it was the, the mass middle class of this country that drives the economy, basically the article's conclusion seems to be that there will be <laughs> dis technological displacement because not of, of globalization necessarily, but of the necessary needs for factories and, and industries to employ and systemize uh, robots. And I just wonder, uh, you know, you're talking about developing uh, maybe the survivals from now, the upper class, the, the really informed, intelligent people that p install and, and maintain and develop and initiate systems, and the mechanics that, replace, that uh, repair the robots and the few people who take the, the, the goods off the truck and put them into the factory. Mm -hmm. It's entitled the dark factory because robots do not need lights, um, right. unemployment, insurance, you know, renegotiation, heat. And um, I just wonder, it, and it uses steel case in the article as an example, and it's obviously did that because of your good history of employee relations. In fact, they, they talk about three employees who end up saying, I'm happy, I've survived the, the downturn, but, and I'm happy because my job is easier because the robots help me. So I, I just wonder what your reflections on it. I don't think it puts you in a defensive mode at all. It, it just, I just wonder how our industry is going to look at that and is the, is the employment of the American middle class at risk here? Yeah, so good question. Um, and uh, I appreciate you uh, referencing the article actually. Uh, participating in an article like that is kind of a scary move as you can imagine, you know, because you know that the writer wants to write about automation and elimination of jobs and uh, so, and we agreed to participate in it because we think there is actually a really uh, good story there. And we were, we were proud to have three people that were on our front lines uh, in our factories, zone leaders and people like this, who have worked in those factories for a long time, participate in the article uh, for the same reason. And what they commented on, and this has really been true, is that to a large degree, the application of technology in factories has eliminated work and they're, in the short run, it can have an effect on the people who are doing that particular job. But in the longer run, it's interesting how new patterns start to emerge. So uh, one of the people quoted in the article was in his late 50s, and he said, when I was younger, I remember that there were older people in the factory that wondered if once they passed 50 or 55 years old, would they be physically able to still do the work? Because you had to lift wood, you had to lift metal, you had a there was a lot of physical effort in a factory, right? I mean, that's how we think of factories from 20 years ago. Uh, but now the application of robotics allows us to use uh, suction grippers and, and motorized mechanisms to assist the person. So anybody, anybody could, could grab this 100 pound piece of wood or steel and lift it now and move it and set it in the right place. And so there's an example. I think what happens is yes, it has a dark side, and then it also has this uh, positive side that allows people to continue their careers in factories maybe longer than they would have in the past. Now, that's not just a random story. I had a chance recently to listen to Gary Kasparov, who you might remember as a chess player, right? So by now we would think that chess players were obsolete, right? Because <laughs> you, know, you could have an app on your phone that could beat Gary Kasparov now at chess. And he lost famously to Deep Blue you know, many years ago when computers got that good. And so he still tells that story, but he also says, you know, he was curious. He's a smart guy, right? He was curious about this chess computer thing. And could people, grandmasters, chess experts, could they play chess 
together with the computer better than either the grandmaster or the computer. And so he started kind of a little experiment about this. And what he learned, interestingly, is that the very best grandmasters were no better when they played with the computer. But the people that were a level or two below the best grandmasters beat the grandmasters when they were playing with the computer and beat often the computer alone. So it's this idea of how do we take the things that, that humans do because machines could not yet do them. There's a lot of work out there that's still that. Most of us don't miss any of that work as it relates to our everyday lives. Uh, and, and maybe recognize that automation and technology will continue to eliminate the jobs that we should never have been doing in the first place. I mean, seriously, there were jobs when I first started working where you, you'd watch somebody work for about an hour and they would take a piece of paper, they would move it to pile B, they would staple it, they would sign their name to it. And that's what they did kind of all day long, maybe some processing. And those jobs have been eliminated. I don't think those jobs made us as human as we deserve to be. And, and so maybe what will happen over time, over time is the key element, and I'm going to acknowledge it in the short run, there's going to be some disruptive effects. But over time, what I'm hopeful of is that technology will allow us to do as humans the things that really make us human. To, to use our creativity, to use our skills around empathy and understanding of other people. Uh, those are the things that I think maybe someday they'll get automated, but not in my lifetime. And so in the short run, we can maybe make life better for people, eliminate work that it's routine and drudgery, and uh, allow each of us to uh, have an opportunity to uh, unlock our full potential. I don't know if you guys have any additional thoughts on that. I, was it Finland? I believe that Finland just rewrote their constitution uh, to allow prototyping of policy to happen. So they used to have it written where it was like, we have to treat everybody the same. And what they've started doing is saying, well, we need, to, we need to be able to prototype and then scale policy. One of the things was around like the universal basic income. So there are, I think, 500 Finns right now who are getting, uh, who, who match a statistical demographic, who are getting this sort of uh, wage. And I think what's exciting is that automation can ideally liberate us from these types of things. Uh, but is there also innovation in policy and or innovation in accounting that might say, well, uh, a, a wage-earning human maybe shouldn't be considered uh, the same sort of expenditure as the, as the purchase of a robot. Like that there are different sort of commercial and communal implications that it has in hiring a human that might, uh, that might incentivize companies to still hire folks. And so I think that it's, it's both scary but then also exciting and that's kind of the ambiguity that I think takes a lot of courage, and it's up to us to make that. Other questions? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, folks. Uh, Jim, uh, I'm a little older, and uh, as I listened to you explaining it, I thought of the number of things that we used to do that are very similar. Uh, I spent over 40 years in the aerospace and defense business with a tier one corporation. And I remember all the things we went through, total quality, lean manufacturing, Six Sigma, uh, 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 computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing, and all those things sound so you know, passe today, but they were revolutionary new back then. And gain sharing, productivity improvements, and all that sort of stuff. And one of my observations was, when you were talking about robots, is that uh, we were talking about that 30 years ago. And it was a lot more scary than it really turned out to be. And that a lot of changes take a lot of time. And you have to learn a lot of things. But my question is uh, that I think industry really learned how to adapt to a lot of these things globally. Uh, and my question is, what do you think about uh, things like public education, higher education, and uh, government learning to adopt uh, these kinds of approaches to problem solving? they certainly don't have a, a track record of being innovative. Uh, that doesn't, that's a generalization, of course, but I think in general most, most places do not. And we've been struggling with these, quote, tough problems for you know, decades. Do you have any thoughts on how this could be applied in government? Do we need different types of people to be elected in the future or what? <laughs> so that's kind of a hand grenade question. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of little uh, signs, uh, lights going off in my head going, don't answer the government question. 
<laughs> so I will, I will cleverly dodge that one. And, uh, but I, I will, uh, I think higher ed is, is fair game. And I'll also just touch on robotics one more uh, time since you uh, mentioned the emergence of these originally. So I do remember when I was working at Motorola in 1983, it was a long time ago, and robots were showing up on the factory line. But the robots weren't very good it was, because it was really hard to put together the components that was in this Motorola equipment. And so they had to go back to the engineers to say, you know, we had done the cost benefit. I was an accountant back then. So I did the cost benefit analysis and you could justify the cost of the robot for the labor you'd eliminate. And you, you know how that math works. Because it took the people on the line X number of minutes to assemble this part and the robot could do it for faster and for less. But the robot needed a lot of uh, help. So the, the parts had to be re-engineered so that the robot could actually grab the parts in a particular way. The robot couldn't bend its, its pincers in a particular way, so the, the connectors all had to be placed in, in spots that were easier to get to. And the thickness of the board had to be changed because it kept breaking when they would put pressure in a certain spot. And by the time the engineers finished redesigning the part that the robot was supposed to build, it had actually cut the cost of people building the same part by so much that we didn't need the robot anymore. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? <laughs> So the robot sat in the corner and we kept uh, making it with humans. And so back to design thinking, you know, I think this idea of like how might we actually make things that are so simple for a robot to do that people could also do it with less carpal tunnel, with, all, with less other problems. And now the question about higher ed, I think I'll just turn over to you guys since uh, it's, it's, I'm not an expert in higher education, but I think we could uh, talk in general. You know, one of the things that uh, we've all uh, experienced is the transition in education from rote learning and teaching towards active learning. Uh, maybe I'll just ask you guys how you think about that from your own experiences and how you think education might change. Yeah, so I'll speak to this, obviously being closer to education <laughs> from a personal perspective. Um, that, that's an old comment again. Yes, that it? was yeah. an old comment. Um, but thinking about how um, design thinking thinks about user-centered design and how learning has, and this isn't even the cutting edge, but how learning thinks about learning styles, in my mind, is, an, is very similar to design thinking, right? It's saying not every child or person learns best by sitting behind a desk and being lectured to. Um, so, so your comment about active learning is what is it that makes us human? What is it that we enjoy doing that brings us delight? How do we learn as humans? And then bringing that into education and saying, how could we think, reimagine the way that we train people, the way that we um, communicate learning so that it's not this thing where you memorize for a test, but really becomes a lifestyle and a mindset of learning and growing. Um, Stanford has done some interesting mental experiments around the future of higher ed, uh, imagining well, what might it look like if this were uh, instead of a, a one-time four-year encounter followed by a career trajectory if you broke it up into cycles. So there's like a year and a half sprint followed by uh, you know, a seven-year stretch of a career. You can come back uh, another year and a half. Um, there are all kinds of models. I think a little bit about Steve Jobs when the original Newton came out. It's like there are these mental models that we have of what higher ed means and to what extent, and, and that power is never going to seed itself naturally. So to what extent is a new thing seen as a threat, uh, a, a, virus, a virus to sort of like shun to the side, uh, and or is that a potential opportunity to collaborate and say like, oh, this is really interesting. Um, let's see if we can make this better and make the institution more flexible. So I, I'm excited about that. Uh, I think in the next five years, we'll see a lot of post-secondary options come on board uh, online, and we'll see what happens. And you, you said something there, Adam, that I want to piggyback on a little bit around fear. So you said, you know, it, it can seem kind of scary. You know, there's this entrenched, we're, we're used to a way of doing things. And I think a lot, of, a lot of the things that change in society, we're resistant to that change. But what I love about design thinking is how it can help us to break through that. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit to how design thinking can help you overcome fear and move forward instead of responding with that antibody. Yeah. Um, I'll maybe the first time that I did design, there was a visceral fear reaction 
Uh, and we were reimagining packaging, and as a graphic designer, it was like I wanted to have all of these like little things accurate and finesse so that it was a finished product. Uh, we took it to a, a retail shop in town that I have a ton of like respect for, um, and it was just like the crappiest cardboard box with like scrawl on it and collateral that looked like garbage. Uh, and I was like, I remember how sweaty my shirt was because it's like I'm showing them this thing that I know looks like trash. Uh, and I was so connected to the object itself uh, that, it, that that was like a big moment in that the designer salesman in me started to die a little bit where it was like, oh, this actually isn't about this box. It's about what this box, uh, is this meeting a need in the folks? And so I think that there's, uh, if we can learn to recognize that fear, on the other side of fear is often growth. And that's maybe to the, to the point about like, these are talks about leadership. And I think the same thing about like personal behaviors where it's like, where is that fear exists that, I, that I'm resistant? And it, is there growth on the other side of that? So. One last question. Yep. Yeah, you, um, just uh, on the article again, it, uh, it would, did talk about the evolution of uh, intelligence. And uh, I think a, a team at the University of um, Columbia, I think it is, was developing, working a program where the, the robot could pick a petal off a, a flower. Mm -hmm. And the idea was robots have to work at 100% efficiency. Uh, it, it can't be below that. So um, the robot recognizes a particular shape or form and, 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 and works. If it's a different shape, it cannot function. Mm -hmm. So they're programming, working to develop systems where the robot will recognize a variation. The very one petal is not exactly like the next. And so it, it could pull the petals off and uh, with the variation of the form. So the evolution continues. Mm -hmm. uh, I just thought I'd add that to your comment. Yeah, so um, one of the most amazing things is when you combine these technologies with artificial intelligence. Uh, so you say, well, the objective is actually to, to remove the petal without breaking it or to um, do things that are almost impossible for humans, which is to pick exactly the, the right part to go in the right box every single time. Uh, and we've learned that programming them only gets you so far, but if you let the computer actually start to learn on its own, it can, again, uh, supplement the human. So the, the, the uh, like if you actually stood in one of our chair factories here in Grand Rapids, you know, where we make uh, seating now, uh, it's interesting for me to watch because it's people building it, but the people are supported by the technology and so if the person reaches into the wrong bin for this particular chair they're making, they're told right away that it's, the bin should have been over here. Uh, and so investing in technology to get us to that level uh, has great economic power because it gets us from 98% accuracy to 100% accuracy. But going the next step to try to get the robot to actually pick that thing up is, is so far not a very good investment. You know, what we're doing actually is making humans much better at doing, um, doing it uh, by, by letting the computer do what the human's not very good at, but letting the, letting the human do what we're actually uniquely good at. And I, I hope that it stays like that. Like, I, I really hope that the pace of change, I, and, I, and I would also shake my head that I can think of examples where it won't. Uh, but I really, um, I'm, I'm voting for humans. Like, I think humans, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm on the team. <laughs> And uh, my hope is that as technology comes along and we use things like design thinking, like let's, let's use new techniques and new approaches to help us uh, have, a new, have new things that we're uniquely good at. Um, so I ask you guys to think, and we're gonna wrap up here by asking you, I'm gonna give you the choice of answering one of two questions. How about that, just to confuse everybody. You can either say, hey, here's one thing you'd recommend to everybody if you wanna learn more about design thinking, uh, here's your go-to, or maybe you can do this and uh, like, is there ju just one quick example from your everyday life? Just something really uh, typical and normal and, and something we can all relate to where you've used design thinking. I'll give you an example while you're thinking because I didn't tell them what the question was going to be. Um, so um, uh, my wife and I are working on a project uh, trying to put a screen porch in a certain place in our cottage in northern Michigan. And, you know, we had kind of laid out the size of it and everything, where it was going to go. 
And there was a bunch of analytical problem solving pieces, like how far it is from the water's edge, for example. You can't be closer than a certain distance and you know, make sure you don't break the law. Right? So that's kind of an important part. It has nothing to do with design thinking. Don't break the law. That's easy enough. Uh, but the hard part is, will we actually like it when we're done? Uh, that's a lot harder, you know, like, how do you know? So, uh, so what do you do when you want to know something in design thinking? Somebody say it. Prototype. You prototype. So we felt a little stupid, but we took like ski ropes, you know, and other uh, lines that we had sitting around, and we kind of designed out the edges of this thing. And we literally took lawn chairs and sat in the middle of our yard for like an hour or two, and then again the next day, to try to say, well, what would it feel like if we were here? And, and what if there was a wall here and something else there? So we would like put things right there in the middle of the yard. I wonder still what the neighbors thought. But <laughs> it gave us great confidence. And we actually moved a few things and changed a few things just by that experience of saying, let's not sit in the kitchen and keep drawing this. Let's go out in the yard and let's feel it. Let's immerse ourselves in it and say, how would it feel if we were looking this direction for the rest of our lives? You know, that's kind of a long time. So you kind of want to get it right. And it was such an easy thing in hindsight just to take the lawn chairs and go out there and go, I don't know, what do you think? What do you think? So there's an example from my life. How about you guys? How about you? Yeah. We'll, we'll end with the best, so I'll go next. Oh, um, I so thought you were going to make it the other way. Oh, uh, no. The best, so why no. don't you go ahead and go and talk? No, humility is a principle of leadership. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> this is why she's in that room, see? <laughs> so I... I I think one of the more powerful things to me in design thinking is just taking a pen and paper and sketching out what you're talking about. And it sounds like, oh, a, a lot of people when they hear I was an art major, like, oh, I can't draw stick figures. And I'm like, trust me, I'm not the ty type of person who can draw you a tractor right now. My nephews can do better tractors than I can. But I think just the act of taking a piece of paper and a pen when you're talking to someone it's amazing what it does to communication because all of a sudden you start pointing to it, you're both engaging in it, and it can make a huge difference. So I think about, um, I serve on my church's women's ministry group, and we were having a conversation about should we break into committees, are the events that we have right? And then we started drawing on a whiteboard and it was like all of a sudden it all made sense. And we were like, oh, okay, we don't need to like create lots of structure and like committees and programs, like, oh, this is how this all makes sense. And so I think I would say my big t biggest takeaway in prototyping is just take, take a pen and paper and like write down what you're talking about. Great. Draw it. We had done an exercise as part of our empathy around this post high school experience uh, with students and said, hey, we want you to sort of imagine uh, a series of forking roads as it goes off in the future. And we want you to think about like all the possible options that are ahead of you at you know, 17, 18 year old. Um, it was uh, eye opening that our initial sheet had like five different pathways and some of our students had a difficult time filling up all five. Uh, and so that said, what I would like, I think my challenge to you is to think about as you're imagining alternative futures for yourself, is to maybe move through a similar exercise. So there are these, get as many possible options as, as you can down on paper, and then see if you can push for like 10 more ideas. Um, just to make yourself a little bit uncomfortable, and then maybe intentionally do one, not like a long-term commitment, because that feels bad, but, but try one that you think you know you'll hate. Just for maybe like a day, uh, as a way to check some of your own assumptions. So our biology, the way that your, our brain works is really gnarly, and I think submitting yourself to one of those things and opening yourself up to say like, well, what is it about this that I actually don't like uh, can be an interesting to, to grow your own perspective about yourself and your own assumptions about your preferences. Very good, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Hannah and Adam for their uh, willingness to join us on stage today and share their thoughts, so thank you guys. <laughs> All right, so one more time, I'm going to ask all those people in the room who raised their hand when I asked the first question, all the people who have practiced design thinking before, you have some experience doing it. Can you raise your hand again? And then you guys can look around and see who's sitting next to you that knows something about this. 
I invite all of you, thank you all for coming and joining us today. There's a ton of people, as, a, as you see in the room, who know a lot about design thinking. John over here is an expert at it. And, uh, and, and uh, we'll be here as well during the reception. We invite you all to join us uh, just outside the doors here uh, as we wrap up. Thank you all for coming. Have a great weekend. Thank you.